I'm Richard Swan, and welcome to this session, What Do Animals Know? Uh, or if you prefer a more sarcastic intonation, what do animals know? This debate is uh, loosely part of the biomedical strand at this year's Battle of Ideas. We are hugely grateful to the Wellcome Trust, because without such sponsorship, these sessions just could not take place. So uh, we are eternally grateful to them. What do animals know? Which immediately raises the question, what do we know about animals? Well, what we do know is that they couldn't take part in the kind of debate we're having this morning, uh, which is why I haven't asked any animals to take part on the panel, uh, apart from my two distinguished speakers. <laughs> so are, are we, Nikki, Helena, myself, uh, all of us, are we just outliers on a continuum that joins us with all other creatures? Or is the human species truly unique, disconnected by its ability to reason from the rest of the animal kingdom in the way that uh, has been historically assumed? What do we know about animal intelligence that we didn't know even 20 years ago? To help us explore these issues, I'm delighted, indeed very excited, uh, to be joined by two world-class speakers. On my right is Professor Nikki Clayton, who is Professor of Comparative Cognition at the University of Cambridge. She's Fellow of the Royal Society, and she's also scientist-in-residence at the Rombert Dance Company. She probably knows more about scrub jays than anybody on the planet. Um, conversely, scrub jays probably know more about her than anybody on the planet, too, which is a, a thought. On my left, uh, Dr. Helena Goldberg, who's director of Spiked, the uh, online current affairs magazine. She's associate lecturer at the Open University, and she's author of Just Another Ape? Question mark, uh, which you should all buy if you haven't already. It's available upstairs in the Barbican Bookshop. Uh, highly recommended. So, Nikki, what do animals know? Well, it's a real privilege and pleasure to be here. I'm Professor of Comparative Cognition, and I chose the word comparative deliberately because I'm interested in the minds of many animals, including humans. So, is there a qualitative distinction between humans and other animals' cognitive abilities? Well, on the one hand, of course there is. What's so special about the human mind? Well. No other animal can read and write, or, as Richard mentioned, take place in a debate like this. So that's the obvious answer. Now, many people assume that thinking is uniquely human too, and therefore animals don't have minds. And that's the point I'd like to argue against, because we do share some of our cognitive abilities with other animals, despite their lack of language, or human language, if you like. So I'd like to challenge the boundaries of the human uniqueness of cognition. And to do so, I want to make two provocative claims. The first is that some non-human animals are capable of imagination. And what I mean by imagination is of the ability to think about things that aren't in the here and now, to allow them to think about other minds and other times. So that's provocative claim number one. Provocation number two is that some of the best evidence for these animal abilities comes not from our closest relatives, the primates, but from our much more distantly related feathered cousins, those beady-eyed crows. Now, members of the crow family, or corvid family, as we ornithologists call them, includes the ravens, the jays, the magpies, the jackdaws, and the crows. And they're bona fide members of the clever club. Like other big-brained animals, such as chimpanzees and dolphins, these birds use and make tools. They show creative problem solving, and they pass the mirror test, which is hailed by some as a marker of self-consciousness. Corvid show sophisticated social smarts and coordinated teamwork. Highly gregarious rooks, for example, use cigarette ends as an insect repellent to smoke out the bugs from under their wings. And for their antics at the M4 memory service station, they won the BBC's prize for Britain's cleverest animals. 
Approaching in pairs, they stand on opposite sides of rubbish bins and pull up the bin liner in tandem, carefully securing the food with their feet until the food is in reach. It takes about 20 pulls on average. And then what they do is they toss each piece over the edge of the bin where another rook is standing by to guard the stash from other potential thieves. But what of their powers of imagination? Well, I want to give you four examples, and they're all based around the fact that these birds cache. Now, what I mean by caching is that they hide food for a living, and they recover these caches at a later date, often many months later. But the problem is these caches are also likely to be stolen by other individuals. And it's this behaviour that seems to be particularly important in the life of corvids because they're both the protector of their own stores or caches of food and thieves of other birds' sashes of food. So they're playing both roles. And we think that's one reason why they have to be so intelligent. They have remarkable memories of where they've hidden their food. It's said that a Clark's nutcracker, for example, caches about 30,000 seeds over the autumn and winter months and can remember them with 90% accuracy when studied in the lab over periods of nine months of time. So that's pretty remarkable. Work in my group has shown that these birds are also capable not only of remembering where they've stashed the food, but scrub jays that Richard mentioned, that I've spent many years studying now, can also remember which food items they've hidden where. And this is a special form of memory, episodic memory, that was once thought to be uniquely human. It's the ability to travel back in the mind's eye to remember the past. They can also imagine the future and plan for it, for example, knowing where to cache food for tomorrow's breakfast in a place where food isn't normally served. They also remember particular individuals and which ones were watching and take action accordingly, protecting those stashes by moving them when those individuals have left the scene. And what's particularly remarkable about this recaching behaviour, we call it, moving the stash from one place to another when the individual who'd seen them cache has gone, is that it turns out that it's only birds who themselves have been thieves in the past that are able to do it. Naive birds don't. So in other words, it takes a thief to no one. And this is thought to be a kind of theory of mind called experience projection. It's putting yourself in one of someone else's shoes in order to know what to do. But it's not always about trickery and competition. They can also be co cooperative, especially when it comes to courtship feeding. Like humans, Eurasian jays are monogamous, so one male, one female, and they pair for life. And the male jays are very good at knowing what their females want to eat, even when it's something quite different to what they want themselves. So they could teach my husband a trick or two. Now, there's increasing evidence then that these birds do have minds. I've given you several examples of their imaginative powers, both about other minds and other times. And what's more, they're just as smart, I will argue, as chimpanzees and the other non-human great apes. The fact that crows or corvids have intellectual capabilities on a par with the apes not only suggests that the derogatory term bird brain is obsolete, but it also challenges assumptions about the uniqueness of our intelligence. Because cognition or thinking or minds must have arisen independently in the apes and the crows. For not all birds and mammals have their brain power. And I just want to finish by saying that this finding raises three important questions. The first concerns brain size. How is it that a bird with a walnut-sized brain is capable of such feats? And one of the greatest mysteries of intelligence is why absolute brain size doesn't matter, but it doesn't appear to. The blue whale has the largest brain of any animal, but it's certainly not the smartest. So overall size isn't everything. For reasons we don't fully understand, one of the things that appears to be important is relative brain size, so relative to body size. And crows and apes have much bigger brains than you would expect them to have based on the size of their bodies. And in terms of relative size, a crow's brain is as big as a chimpanzee's. A second issue concerns the type of brain that supports intelligence. Because the bird's brain is very differently structured to that of all mammals, including humans, bereft as it is of the six-layered structure of our neocortex, which has long been thought to provide the unique machinery for intelligence. 
Avian brains have what's called a nucleated structure. You can think of it as more like a fruit cake than the mammalian six-layered Austrian sucker torta or chocolate cake. Now, although their brains are organized differently in architecture, recent neuroanatomical studies have revealed that both the connectivity and the functional circuitry of the bird brain is far more similar to ours than previously thought. So you could think of the comparison between their brains and ours as being a bit like the difference between an Apple and a PC computer. And finally, my final third point, how widespread is this intelligence? Might there just be an untapped source of other alien minds out there that we share our planet with? So next time you take a walk in the park or you stop at the M4 memory service station, spare a thought for those feathered apes and don't leave your car window open. They just might steal your food when you're not looking. For these thieves aren't thick. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Nikki, and for opening up that debate. So, Helena. In terms of the questions in the blurb, is there a qualitative distinction between human and other animals' cognitive abilities? My argument is yes, unequivocally. Has the old disconnect between Homo sapiens and all other animals been undermined by recent advances in the knowledge of other species' conscious, consciousness, making the uniqueness of humans questionable? And my answer to that is no. You don't need to carry out scientific research on what animals do or don't know and how it compares to human beings in order to answer this question. Now, I do think your research is very important and other, uh, uh, the others who are studying what animals do and do not know, their research is very important. But I don't think we do need to um, get an uh, insight into what animals do and don't know in order to answer the question of whether there's a qualitative qualitative distinction. I think we just need to look around us. You both referred to the fact that, you know, we didn't, you didn't invite any animals to take part in um, uh, this panel. We know that, you know, it's not the case that corvids and apes and other animals get together to discuss how they um, uh, are different from other animals, but just do it a little, not so often as us. It's not the case that other animals build cathedrals, play chess, develop algebra, write poetry, but just do it a little bit less than us. There is a vast gulf between humans and other animals, and I think that is just evident in the way that we live our lives and the progress that we've uh, made. So in some senses, I do find it baffling when people are arguing that there's not a qualitative distinction. But at the same time, I also know it's a very human thing to anthropomorphize. Because we don't just look at the behavior of our fellows, we always make inferences about what are their motives, what's going on inside their heads. And I think it's a very human thing to look at animals and read their behavior on the basis of human emotions and human intentions. Um, but I think it's very important that we continually question those assumptions when we're looking at animal behavior. Where I suppose Nikki and I would agree is I would say that if you were to ask, is there uh, a continuity between humans and other animals in terms of our natural abilities, I would say yes. Although I, I think it's very difficult to work out what our natural abilities are once we've developed culture. But most likely, you know, as a thought experiment, I would say, well, yes, there's bound to be a uh, continuity. And uh, one of the motivations, as I understand, for um, Richard and Leslie organizing this session was the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness. And in uh, 2012, a group of international neuroscientists gathered at the University of Cambridge to reassess the biological substrates of human conscious experience and related behaviors in human and non-human animals. And they concluded that the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. And uh, to me, that's not at all surprising. We are the product of evolution like any other animal, and our unique abilities will not have just fallen from the sky or emerged out of uh, nowhere. So for human mental capacity to have risen, there must have been various cognitive um, structures in place already, and that could be memory for what and where, um, uh, cognitive maps, ability to categorize objects uh, on the basis of perceptual sim similarities, being able to categorize uh, quantities, 
simple forms of uh, social learning and such like. Those cognitive structures must have been in place. You know, are, are, uh, the emergence of the mind couldn't have just emerged uh, out of nothing, out of thin air. I think that at some point in our evolutionary past, it's, uh, there was a small difference that led to a dramatic, uh, dramatically different outcome. For much of the six million years since our lineage diverged from our common ape ancestors, we remained little more than glorified chimpanzees in the tools that we used and the way that we lived. But then something dramatic took effect around 60,000 years ago, where you see a, a transform, transformation in the way that humans lived. And some people refer to this as cultural takeoff. So with cultural takeoff, you know, up until then, yes, we might have used more sophisticated uh, tools, but we were really living like chimpanzees. And then you see the emergence of cave, cave paintings, more sophisticated tool making, more sophisticated uh, hunting techniques, ceremonial burials, uh, evidence of uh, jewellery, animals being buried with humans, and the amazing thing is travel across oceans. From chipping away, you know, uh, at uh, knots, for instance, to uh, travelling across oceans. And 5,000 years ago, you see the first evidence of written language. So you see the development of culture, <coughs> civilization, and it, out of that, I would argue, um, that the mind has arisen. So when you move into the realm of symbolic communication, which I think happened because of the small difference that allowed for cumulative cultural learning, then basically the soul or the mind or whatever you call it can fly. Um, uh, and reach ever greater heights as a result. Meanwhile, apes have not moved beyond their hand-to-mouth existence. Their lives have changed very little in the six million years since we split from our com common ancestors, which I would argue is because apes don't have the capacity for cumulative cultural transmission. You know, they can't imitate, they can't ape. Really, it's because we have got the capacity for cumulative cultural transmission that we have created culture, we have created uh, uh, language, and with that you see the emergence of the mind. And that means that we are not constrained by biology, whilst I would argue that all other animals are constrained by their biology. We don't have wings, we can't fly, so we invent and build aeroplanes. We don't have sharp claws and uh, teeth for hunting, so we make weapons. We don't have the same inbuilt capacity as migrating birds have traveling vast distances with real accuracy what distinguishes us is that we are able to put our heads together we're not confined to our individual brain we put our heads together and we are able to, to achieve so much more than any one of us would be able to achieve on our own but that's not to say that animals can't do amazing feats honeybees can communicate with amazing accuracy the location of pollen-rich food through their waggle dance. Spiders can build intricate webs to trap uh, insects. Migrating birds can, can travel vast distances and they're able to use celestial clues, uh, the Earth's ma magnetic field and seem to have some mental maps, cognitive maps as well to find their way around. So it's undoubtedly the case that animals are able to perform amazing feats, but I think these amazing feats are the product of their evolutionary history, and they are constrained by their evolutionary history. So a spider, I mean, I don't know exactly how they do what they're doing, you know, making the silk and uh, uh, um, making these amazing spider's webs, but they can't say, oh, every spider around me are building the same spider web and that is all I can do and I'm now sick of it. I think what I'll do, think about a different way of trapping insects. You know, I'm going to sit down, put some thought into this, maybe draw up a map and then, you know, build it. They can't do that. Um, and migrating birds can't des decide that, okay, the risk of migration is just too great because it's a very risky business at migrating. Maybe I should stay put. Maybe I, you know, but I, the, the weather, it's going to get cold, so if I'm going to stay put, I'm going to have to build something with central heating. They can't do that. So I do think animals are constrained by their biological makeup, and I think we have to be very, very careful. We have to guard against looking at animal behavior and interpreting it in human terms, because I don't think it does actually help us understand 
animal behaviour, and it downgrades human achievement. And I think if, if scientists didn't continually question their assumptions, we might still think that Hans, the clever Hans the Stallion, could perform algebra. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think although there's a, a lot of common ground, I think there is uh, a clear line in the middle of this, which uh, I'm hoping we'll be able to explore and with the help of the audience as well in a moment. Uh, but before we get to that, I'd just like to sort of uh, pull the, the speakers together a, a little bit. Um, Nikki, I, I, I'm interested in a sense how you respond to that, particularly sort of uh, Helena's idea that perhaps, you know, that the claim that mind um, has arisen perhaps only uh, over the last 60,000 years when humanity had largely stopped evolving um, in any great f fashion. Um, does it make sense to talk about human minds as different to animal minds? Can we actually say that, uh, lacking language and so on, we shouldn't be sort of comparing animal minds with human minds. What we should be doing is looking at animal minds as some other kinds of, uh, of intelligence. All my arguments are based on two things. What we mean by human and what we mean by minds. And what I, we mean by human, I don't mean define what a human being is. That's trivial. What I mean is at what level we're going to compare our humans. So, quite often when I'm giving lectures on the evolution of cognition, I draw a little graph of, of human intellectual development and I show this period of 60,000 years of intellectual stasis you were referring to, and then this cultural takeoff. And I point out that really, if we want to be comparing like with like, we should be comparing our animals with this biological period down here. But there's a problem with that, isn't there? That however brilliant we are at, at building aeroplanes and other forms of space travel, the one thing we can't do is go back in time to study the minds of those people when they were alive. And so that's one of the questions about the nature of the comparison. Are we talking about the biological basis of human behaviour, in which case we shouldn't be focusing on all this cultural aspect, or are we not? And depending on your answer to that question depends on what aspects you're looking at. And the second thing is what you mean by the mind. I'm not arguing that animals are as smart as human beings. And when I talk about cognition, I mean the ability to problem solve and think rationally and be able to do, take certain abstract principles. But these abstract principles that animals can do depends on your species, but of course compared with what we have, they are limited. One thing that I find fascinating, some of the research that I do compares young children, which is another version of are we talking about adult humans or young children, it's back to the what do we mean by human question. And one of the um, interesting findings that we did recently that I want, want to briefly mention because it's an example of, of how it's been useful to compare animals and humans and what it tells us a bit about both is called the Aesop's Fable task. And this is a, a little task that my husband and his PhD student at the time, who was amusing, amusingly called Chris Bird, so you can imagine the journalists have a field day with Bird who was studying rooks. They had a little task like this, where you have a, a tube of water. It was based on the Aesop's Fable, the crow and the pitcher, and, and the water level's quite low. And in the fable, the thirsty crow wants to drink the water and can't reach the water and puts stones in to raise the water level. In Nathan Emery and Chris Bird's experiments, the rook was, saw a tasty worm floating on the top of the water, so we didn't do anything nasty. They weren't thirsty, but they were motivated because there was a treat in there, and they used stones to raise the water level. And we did the same thing with jays and children, and of course, jays and children can easily solve this task. And what we were interested in was a condition in which... I'm going to improvise here. You have three three tubes, and this is what it looks like from the perspective of the child or the jay, just as it does for you in the audience, and there's a worm floating in this one, but you've now got to imagine, with powers of imagination, that actually this is, this is going to cover on it so that the hole in the top is only about that big, so there's no way that the stones, which are this size, is going to be able to get into that container. 
And these two have water in as well, but no worm. Or, or in the case of children, we use stickers, which can be exchanged for a big, I'm as clever as a crow, University of Cambridge sticker, which all the kids really, they were all desperate for these special stickers. And what we found is, of course, the birds don't solve this task. They look at this and go, well, I can't stick my stones in the relevant place. I have no idea. And they just fly off and they don't perform the task. But the children eventually solve the task and discover, say, that actually if you put stones in this one, you can get the worm through this one. Most of the children don't know how it works. They just attribute it to magic. In fact, the real reason it worked is that there's a YouTube hidden behind the table connecting these two, of course. Most of the children didn't know that, but they were able to solve the task. And I think what, what that experiment has shown, and, and there's another version of the task where you just had, have one tube and you have pebbles that are sinking and floating. And the crows are really good at this. They only put the sinking ones in, and if they accidentally put a floating one in, they immediately remove it. They have no problem solving that. And yet our children couldn't pass the task till they were eight. So we've got one task where the cr crows are much better than the children, one task where the children are much better than the crows. And so I think that's doing those kinds of experiments are important because they show you both the similarities and differences in the cognitive mechanisms or the thinking thought processes that are going on when the animals and children are solving the task. So I do think comparisons between humans and animals are important in terms of what they tell us. Not because I'm trying to say that a child is... Is an eight-year-old child is like a crow, or a crow is like an eight-year-old child. Obviously, they're not. But in looking at the ways in which they solve the task, I might tell you something about the way in the, which these different processes have evolved. Brilliant. Thank you. Historically, there has just been this sense, I mean, I, even I grew up with it, and that's not historically very long ago, uh, that human beings were the only creatures on the, on the planet with minds of any kind, the only creatures with the ability to reason, the only creatures with cognitive powers. Uh, every other creature was believed to be just hardwired and it was done by instinct and there were no cognitive processes at work at all. Um, and I, interestingly, even I mean, uh, in, in your book, uh, Helena, you say on, on page 20, you know, um, the reason animals will do seemingly intelligent things one minute, incredibly stupid things the next, is because they lack any conscious awareness of what they're doing, um, which seems to sort of go with that kind of uh, ancient historical sense that we are separate because they can't do any of these things. And, and that seems to me uh, the area which has perhaps moved over the years. And I wonder even, you know, since, since 2010 when the book came out, whether actually we have moved from that ancient historical and obviously often religious belief in the uniqueness of human beings to a point where we see no other animals are not intelligent in the same way as we are any shape or form but they do have cognitive abilities they do have an intelligence of a form listening to you nikki i actually agree with a lot of uh, what you were saying and when i said that I don't think we need to carry out scientific research to understand what animals know and the difference between what we know and animals know in order to answer the question about whether there's a qualitative distinction. That's in order to answer the question, of, is there a fundamental difference? But I do think it's very interesting to look at what animal... But it's very difficult to work out what language to use, mm. but, you know, mm. what animals know, I suppose, what cognitive structures are in place because it might tell us what was already in place that allowed for this emergence of our uniqueness based on our cumulative uh, cultural learning. Now I, I would say, uh, Richard, I'd still stick with the, the idea that there is not conscious awareness but of course that boils down to well, what do you mean by conscious awareness but I would say if you uh, from, from all the evidence I reviewed now I particularly did look at eight studies, but I did get drawn to looking at some of the studies on uh, corvids as well. And, it, it, you know, it's baffling in a way that the R lines, the corvid line, the human line, uh, um, diverged about 280 million years ago, and the ape line six million years ago. And I looked at so many ape studies that showed that apes are not actually that clever. 
Um, and some of the studies that you refer to, I'm thinking, well, this, you know, none of the apes could have, uh, would have performed on those tasks. And Tomasello at the Wolfgang um, Carlo Centre in Leipzig and others who've carried on research on apes have said that generally, you know, when they compare chimpanzees, orangutans and gorillas to human children on just cognitive tasks of understanding of physical laws, they, uh, they're fairly similar up to about two years of age. But they're already distinct from before one year, of age, one year of age in terms of understanding of intentionality that you actually see in very young children. So in terms of their social cognition, you already see a difference between um, uh, humans and animals. But I would say that still nothing has convinced me from the, all the research that I've looked at that animal behaviour can be on explained on the basis of co particular cognitive processes that would have been selected for through evolution and will be species specific, coupled with trial and error learning, and in some species you also see more simple forms of social learning. So rat pups, for instance, will only eat what their mother eats. There seems to be some simple form of social learning amongst birds. But it's not the mind, because the mind would mean being able to consciously consider what it is that you're about to do and what you've done, and then you would think about how to improve it. And I, I am baffled by some of the research on, on Corvids, but I'm thinking, how could, you know, it cannot possibly be the case that they're looking at a problem and they're thinking, ooh, how do I solve this? And work it out in their mind before they work it out practically. It, it, it just doesn't make sense because if you do that, you know, once children move to that level of working out problems symbolically, their mind becomes transformed. I just think we have to continually question and look at how might we be able to explain the fact that tool use and problem solving seems to be a lot more impressive amongst birds than it is amongst apes or any other animal. Yeah. I'm sure my speaker's lots more to say, but I'm aware also uh, that the audience will have lots of things to say. Hi, thanks. Fascinating discussion. I'm learning quite a lot. On the subject of imagination, and that is something, I'm with William Blake on this, I think it is the human form divine. And I think there's something, I mean, what you're saying is absolutely interesting and fascinating, but I would really do, would like to preserve that idea of the imagination as something that is intrinsically human, because I think it is something that is transformative. Um, and there's that wonderful moment at the beginning of J Jacob Winovsky's Ascent of Man where he sees the, the fish coming in on the sea and they, they've come in instinctually because they're going to mate. And then he switches to a um, pole vaulter and he says, we transform the physical. That m human imagination transforms the physical into something else. And it's a bit like ballet dancers who have muscle memory. It's a physical thing. But it's the imagination to translate that into something dramatic, moving, touching, that transforms it. So I really want to preserve the imagination as something that's human, despite all the fascinating things about scrub jays that you've spoken about. Thank you. Could you say something about dolphins? There's so much mythology around the minds of dolphins. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Nice short. A lot of talk about the mind earlier was, I mean, behaviourists would even question whether humans have a mind. You also, sorry, this is more to uh, uh, Dr Gilbo. <laughs> mentioned they do something sensible, they do stupid things next. Um, I've yet to see, I am besotted by her, but I've yet to see my dog do anything stupid next, in all, in all truth. And, um, I mean, to give uh, some examples, you know, I throw the ball and she goes where the ball's going to go, which is something that many footballers don't seem to be able to achieve when I watch <laughs> She's completely made up her own sort of dance, a sort of majorette dance. I have no idea why she does it, but she sort of uh, does that every morning uh, for herself. She has such a human, I, I'm going to use the word human, she has such a desire to catch the ball if it's thrown before it lands on the floor. It doesn't make any difference to her life, I'd have thought, but she's got that desire, so she's a brilliant cricketer as well. She chases squirrels, and you mentioned about crows. A friend of mine has done massive studies on crows, but he's also doing a massive study on squirrels as well. And 
certainly they're intelligent. If you've got nuts in the garden, you serve everybody's probably. But um, in terms of squirrels, I'm amazed that she goes, she doesn't chase the squirrel, she goes to the tree to which she thinks that squirrel's going to go to, which to my mind seems very intelligent. Okay, can, um, you, uh, can I just say up? one last point? Last week, a friend of mine fell rather badly in the, in the street, masses of blood, very visible. It then rained profusely. The only place where she, my dog looked, you know, two days later were the two places where her blood had been. So she's obviously got a huge sense of smell and also obviously emotional literacy, which seems mind boggling compared to many humans I know. I want to ask that if there's no absolute divide between humans and some creatures at least, um, but it's more like on a scale maybe. Um, does this mean anything for ethics? Would you even go into like a singer kind of direction or is the ethics that we now pursue is correct? Just a, a kind of technical question. Helena mentioned crossing oceans as something that, are, that only humans have done. And as far as I know, there, it depends on what you mean by human. Because the Indonesian hobbits, which have a brain the size of a grapefruit, and the, the so-called Indonesian hobbit, yeah, the recently discovered tiny hominid, apparently must have crossed the ocean to, to get to Indonesia. So you had some, some of the species that preceded our human species made it um, in, uh, into the um, Indonesian ar archipelago. We already knew that, you know, the so-called Java man. I don't know if you'd count Java man as human. And Homo, you know, the <laughs> Indonesian hobbit, I, I forget the, the correct specific name, um, apparently did it too. So w was that animal behavior or was that human behavior at a very early stage? I'll bring the speakers back in to comment on any of the things that they wish to pick up, and then we'll go out for another round. There are a number of very nice experiments that have been done on dolphins, and they are thought to be highly intelligent, part of the clever club, if you like, along with the chimpanzees and the crows. They've done studies using the mark test to look at the way in which they respond to a mark when they can see it in a mirror. And we don't really know what the mark test what the, passing the mark test means. Some people would argue it's evidence of self-awareness. I would not fall into that camp. I don't think it's clear at all what the mark test tells you, but there do seem to be two types of animal response to the mark test. There's the kind of animal that looks at the mirror image and, and goes like Tigger in Winnie the Pooh's tails. Oh my God, I thought I was the only one, and dives under the bed and starts attacking the mirror image and treats it as another individual. And there's a very few select um, group in the Clever Club that don't respond in that way. They seem to be able to use the mirror to look at the marks, and they seem to treat it as if it's somehow related to them, precisely so they react more like Pooh Bear. But just as with Pooh Bear, intellectually, the issue is whether that really is evidence that they understand it is them or it's like them. And the problem with Pooh Bear's response in the mirror is having used the mirror to sew up the sides of his teddy bear and do these mirror-guided movements, he said, it looks just like me. But of course, if he understands that, it, that the reflection in the mirror is him, then he should say, not it's like me, but it's me. So that's the issue with mirrors. But dolphins are one of the few animals that and pass the mirror test. They, have ex they are great vocal learners, and they have extremely complex social systems, both their communicative systems, they have these whistle signature songs, and also the, the way in which they have formed these complex societies or alliances, what are called super alliances. So dolphins are thought to be highly intelligent and have highly developed brains. The other point I'd like to pick up on is imagination. Now, for the purposes of this audience, I was using it in a particular way. In fact, the cognitive terms I would use psychologically to describe what I was calling in this circumstance imagination is mental time travel, the ability to travel forwards and backwards in time in the mind's eye to think about the past and plan for the future, and theory of mind, the ability or mental attribution, the ability to think about what others are doing. That said, I think that if we mean imagination in this broader sense, I actually think that that's been absolutely critical and probably played a lot, much bigger role than language per se in the evolution of our own abilities. 
um, coupled with all this cultural ratcheting. And that's because I think that one thing that we can do that so far there's very little evidence that animals can do is we can see things that can't be seen. We're seeing them using our imagination in the mind's eye. So I agree that there's a big difference between the kind of precursor-like mental time travel and theory of mind abilities that I'm talking about. And in fact, in my own scientific research, I wouldn't even say that a J has episodic memory. I would say a J has episodic-like memory because I would argue that we have evidence for the behavioral criteria, but we have no evidence for or against whether that's accompanied by the phenomenological consciousness that approaches mental time travel. And then the um, final one I'd like to talk about is the, the dog examples. They're, they're beautiful examples, but of course what you really need to study it scientifically is to do experiments to test various hypotheses, because what you want to know, for example, is did the dog really remember, or was it using the smell um, and you know, to what extent has the animal done a particular behaviour before and associated a particular response with a particular outcome, which is fascinating and evidence of learning, but by my definition, that would not be sufficient to say that it was a cognitive behaviour. So that's my other reason why I think that studies of animal cognition, where you actually look at various possible hypotheses or explanations and then test them, is so important. Helena, I mean, other hominids, I mean, you know, uh, I mentioned to you, I have a very deep interest in the Neanderthal phenomenon and how far the Neanderthals, who were, of course, uh, shared the planet, they were another human species which shared the planet with us until about 30,000 years ago, you know, were they human? Did they have minds? Um, there is growing evidence that they undertook a whole series of practices, burial practices, art, artwork, and so on. Uh, which actually qualify them perhaps as modern humans. Um, so the whole issue of other hominids is an interesting one, I think, in, in the evolutionary pathways. Yes, I mean, I, I'm not a specialist on evolution. I'm not a biologist. I'm a de developmental psychologist. But I did write a chapter on consciousness and evolution in Just Another Ape because I thought it's important. Is it, there's a really difficult conundrum to answer, which is, you know, are we just the products of evolution like all our other animals? Do we explain our unique abilities on the basis of uh, evolution? And if not, you know, the likes of Richard Dawkins would come along and say, well, if it's not evolution, then what you're uh, at, um, explaining on the basis of is something spiritual, you know, something that's uh, fallen from the sky. So I wanted to look at some of the theories that we put forward for what might there be. And, and it's all going to be, you know, I suppose guesswork on the basis because the knowledge that we have our, of our evolutionary past is still very fragmented mm. um i thought stephen myden's art uh, argument for uh, the coming together of sort of social language with various sort of modules within the mind and that was brought together and led to a unique flexibility in our thinking i thought that was very persuasive and then i read thomas eller's argument about the development of an understanding of others as intentional beings, and that was the key thing that allowed for that connection between minds and the development uh, of uh, symbolic thinking. But both of them, you know, uh, I think what we know about Neanderthal man is very fragmented. Both of them se seem to argue that, well, actually, uh, our genome has been in place for 200,000 years, and about 100,000 years ago, we were, yes, we were more sophisticated than apes, but we were glorified apes, and similarly were Neanderthal, and the burials were different, uh, you know, they bury their um, dead with other things like animals or jewellery or whatever, so, and they argue that they, they would, there is no evidence of, of mind there. Um, maybe it will turn out that we're wrong, but I think we have a lot more to learn on that area in terms of our evolutionary past. On the question of dogs, I mean, I think what, what dogs are capable of uh, is fascinating. And I don't know if any of you have watched Caesar the Dog Whisperer, because he continually shows the, his owners, mad Californians, who think you know, that their dog is suffering from abuse earlier on, and that's why, what's shaping their behavior at the moment. And he says, no, they're dogs. They're influenced by your emotions. They read your emotions like a book. Now, that is not to argue, because he's very uh, uh, um, careful to say, 
show how he can explain it on the basis of their either evolutionary past. It doesn't mean they're psychologists, but they can pick up on tiny changes. And, you know, I might not notice that somebody I'm with is suddenly getting a bit an anxious. You could s see that if you studied it in detail by the fact that they're walking slightly differently, their heart rate's increasing, they're uh, you know, emitting certain smells, but dogs can pick up on these things. Yeah. But that is explained on the basis of their evolutionary past. And they do not have the flexible intelligence that humans have. I don't know if that's what you were arguing, any animal capable of mental time travel or theory of mind. I would argue only human beings would be able to... But again, it depends on definition. definition. Yes, they have a memory of the past, and that makes sense that that would be searched for through evolution, you know, particularly if they have to... Uh, uh, squirrels as well bury food, don't they, for... Uh, um, later on, that, 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 that kind of memory would be selected for through evolution. But I wouldn't call it mental time travel, because that, that, that implies some sort of conscious awareness of your memory and being able to think about it consciously. So I would choose different words. Possibly some animals pass the theory of mind test, but there are some who raise questions about them, even apes, whether they are able to pass, uh, not theory of mind, self-recognition, yeah. sorry, sure. self-recognition, yeah. are they able to recognise themselves in the mirror? <coughs> there are some questions raised about those experiments, but because possibly they can, so possibly they have a bodily recognition of, of themselves, but I think that's very different from the sense of self that human beings um, uh, develop, and there's no evidence, I would argue, of animals having a theory of mind. I'm a student in neuroscience. We do all this great research about animals, uh, which I'm very much in favour of, but then, especially in these behavioural studies, it seems that we interpret the results in a kind of human framework. So we assume that they must have um, a theory of empathy or of the ability to put themselves into others. Why don't they have other mechanisms to solve that question? Why are we looking for humanistic explanations for these results? Dr. Goldberg uh, briefly mentioned uh, flexible intelligence. We haven't spoken about the ability of humans, of the human hand, to influence the way in which we can learn and get feedback about our world. You, you've got to tick this. You've both got to tick this. And if you tick off all those tick lists, then you know, you've got consciousness. Just as a sort of mind experiment, could you apply that tick list to a completely different architecture, say a termite's nest, and say, that termite's nest has consciousness, even if the individual termites in it don't. Uh, a quick question, to sort of phrase that a different way around uh, for Helena. It, it, we've, we've had a strand about robots and, you know, and artificial intelligence. Um, but at what point, if you had a tick list, would you say that artificial intelligence has passed the Turing test and has become conscious? I think there's a certain danger in looking at um, animal cognition and comparing it to early childhood development, just at one simple level. The introduction of culture and learning actually transforms cognitive processes, and this is very important. Children may have simple cognitive processes, but those get transformed through learning and become much more complex. The problem is that many of those complex functions become automated and may resemble simpler functions. So you think of things like memory, um, where you may, it may appear that they are analogous between a young child and an older person, but memory is transformed through cultural interaction. You know, similarly, a lot of cognitive processes may look very similar to animals at a very simple level, but our cognitive processes have actually been transformed and have become automated. And therefore, I think there's a real danger in trying to equate those cognitive processes. I was just wondering if either of you could maybe comment on dreams in terms of imagination and maybe mental time travel. In light of UCL, the recent research that won the Nobel Prize, uh, where you had uh, grid cells, uh, you know, for GPS location. I mean, you talked about episodic memory there. I mean, what evidence is there that's related to time? It, it's a you know, sophisticated GPS relating location. Um, on top of that, sorry, um, 
I wonder what you thought about the Cambridge Declaration when we, we don't have a clear idea of what consciousness is. It's not a bit vain to go around saying that, in fact, animals do have it. Building on the idea that culture is important, um, you said that animals can't write poetry. We know that they can respond to emotions and they possibly can feel emotions. What if they had an oral culture? Well, what if in that rabbit burrow there's a blind bard? I'm going to use mental time travel as my example, I think. As a psychologist with a zoology background, I certainly don't look at animals in terms of human feats, not at all. In fact, I've spent most of my time studying the complex food caching behaviour of a number of different species of corvids, asking the extent to which the species do things similarly or differently, to what extent that's shaped by their ecology and the environment in which they live. Mental time travel is a specific term. It was defined by Suddendorf and Corbelis to be the ability to remember the what, where and when of the past and to plan for the future accordingly. The argument in psychology is that a question about whether or not it's unique in humans, most psychologists would say that the behavioural evidence that animals have it is there, and that's been shown by a number of experiments that we have done and have been published in Nature magazine. The issue is whether or not they have the associated phenomenological consciousness that's associated, for example, with being aware of being the owner of the memory and knowing that I have a mind and that it can travel backwards and forwards in time, as opposed to there being a query about whether animals can remember the what, where and when of a past event. I would argue that the problem with trying to study consciousness in animals is that we don't really know what consciousness is. There may be many types. I don't think we know what it's for and so how, how and why it evolved. And I can't see a way of testing whether or not animals have these types of phenomenological consciousness that are associated with mental time travel. So I think that's the thing. In terms of John O'Keefe's finding of the discovery of place cells, which won him the Nobel Prize, and um, Maybrit Moser and Ed Moser, who discovered the grid cells, which contributed to the other half of the Nobel Prize. It's fascinating that we know that these cells in the hippocampus play such a cru crucial role in navigation. We don't yet know whether and to what extent they might be involved in remembering the past and planning for the future. Um, and as for the Cambridge Declaration, um, I can't say I'm a big fan. Um, I think it's a shame that there were so few people that actually study the evolution of cognition on the panel, um, or more philosophers. But I don't personally buy the argument that just because animals have the same areas of the brain, that that necessarily follows that those same areas of the brain are always doing the same thing. And even if they were doing the same thing, I don't think it's necessarily accompanied by consciousness for precisely the arguments that I said that scrub jays have episodic-like memory and the like went in there because I'm saying I think we have behavioural evidence but we don't have evidence of consciousness. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Helena. Yes, well, I, I'd agree with a lot of that and, I and I'd agree with you that it's very difficult to work out how on earth do you test whether or not they do have that? Mm -hmm. The one thing that I thought was very uh, interesting in terms of uh, one of the areas I've been looking at is language, children's language development, and do animals have language? And there are those who argue that because they present communication as the same as language. Mm -hmm. And when <laughs> Seaforth and Cheney mm -hmm. found that vervet monkeys had a variety of different alarm calls for different mm -hmm. uh, predators, that is used by many to say, well, that there's, that's some kind of language. But they themselves said that we, we have to be very careful. We found that they have specific alarm calls for specific predators. We cannot conclude that they, you could say, do they have a phenomenolo phenomenological awareness of their own communication? Are they intentionally communicating? So they said we have to test that assumption. One way in which it wasn't tested, I don't know exactly how they carried it out, but they looked at whether the vervet mother would use the alarm call if the vervet mother was not approached by a predator but their offspring was, and they didn't. 
They only did it when they themselves were approached. So Thomas Salo argues that this shows that actually it's like an emotional reaction, the way that you might go, whoop, you get a fright. You know, it, it's, it's an instinctive uh, reaction, and that's how their um, uh, communication has developed. And there's no evidence of an intentionality. Otherwise, they would make use that. Um, I'm not saying there's a simple answer to work out how do you get an insight into the behavioural evidence is there, is there evidence of mind? No. Is there, is there evidence that there's definitely no mind? No, because we haven't carried out those experiments. But we do need to really think creatively about how you can carry out those experiments. That is brilliant. Uh, the two things that have impressed me very much this morning, I think the first one is in fact how nuanced the discussion has managed to be uh, within a, a comparatively limited time and, and you know, Helena's wish that we always keep questioning everything that we're doing, I think you know, has been amply demonstrated. We are constantly questioning. But the other thing that impresses me is how much our, our understanding of our own species and of all the other spe species on the planet is increasing uh, year by year, and that continues to provoke fascinating questions, which I, I certainly, I hope all of you will want to continue reflecting on in the years ahead. But I really, really would like to rethank uh, speakers for helping us uh, navigate that. Thank you very much indeed.